بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream on a gorgeous Wednesday and it is between Dohr and Asr here in the, United, in, in the United States in the great state of New Jersey where we're streaming right down the street from the University Hospital Robert Wood Johnson Medical Center and Rutgers University Today we have a wonderful guest. We have somebody who has enriched, I would say, the intellectual and spiritual lives of, I could think I could say, millions of people now, based on his viewers. And his Twitter handle is also, nobody has had more impact with less words than our guest. Let's bring him on, Omar. Paul Williams of Blogging Theology. Alaikum salam rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So you made me laugh. You made yeah. me laugh. <laughs> but it, it is true, though, right? Well, if, if you, I, I like, to, I like, to, I like tweets that yep. are concise, impactful, hopefully witty, yep. and to the point, rather than you know explaining everything uh -huh. and getting all the grammar wrong and the spelling wrong. So yeah, it, I, yep. I, I like epigramma, epigra, epigrammatic tweets. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I love those tweets that you can read in less than three seconds. Exactly. And, and that's one of the reasons why uh, you know, the picture is worth a thousand words, because in, yeah. in, in a millisecond, you get all these messages in one. Yeah. Right. And it's brilliant. And oftentimes your tweet is just a picture yes. uh, with one line. Yeah. Right. That, that, and, all, and sometimes just a just a picture. And I think that's even the best because I like to very much assume that people who are uh, uh, seeing my stuff are intelligent and can actually yep. work out the message for themselves. They do not need to be spoon fed what exactly. I'm trying to communicate. So um, there's a deliberate attempt there to actually minimize my own verbal contribution to allow yeah. people to figure it out for themselves. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's part of my agenda, really. It also, when you when you say less and you put a, uh, a, a, a picture up there, uh, you actually save yourself a lot of headache and heartache because people won't come after you. Right. I'm just putting up a picture. Right. People go after the picture. Right. There is that. But it's also it is actually uh, people uh, can be misunderstood. For example, my no design uh, post, which we've been yep. doing for a while now. There are people out there and uh -huh. I come across occasionally who are absolutely convinced that I'm an atheist. Wow. No, seriously, because I say no design. They, they yeah. got it wrong. Then they got the facial <laughs> expression. Exactly. They miss the emoji with the yep. eyes looking up. Basically go, huh? And uh -huh. they, miss, they miss the irony. The, uh, there's a, a subtext to this. So they're not doing the work, which yeah. is what I'm hoping to do, by reading it intelligently. And uh, I've, I've had arguments with people trying to tell them I'm not an atheist, and they don't agree with me about my views <laughs> when I call myself a Muslim. So, I mean, it's kind of really weird. I mean, they know what I think better than I do. I mean, crazy. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the all-time, and I say this generally, the all-time best refutation of of evolution is the picture is your picture next to the statue of <laughs> charles darwin hashtag no design rolling guys right because yeah. think about that brilliance of that because we nobody would accept that the statue has no design right has to have a person behind it with an intellect a will an ability right and knowledge right and, and we should say knowledge not intellect knowledge Life, ability, and willpower. Yeah. These four attributes cannot exist outside of a statue, right? Yeah. No, I, I enjoyed that. Uh, that having that photograph, I thought I've got to have my photograph taken with Charles Darwin. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but if I can just clarify one point. Yeah. People often sometimes think uh, that I'm anti-evolution. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, that's not quite. Uh, I'm a creationist. But then mm -hmm. all believers are creationists. Every single Christian, believing Jew. Um, but it doesn't mean I, I believe the universe was created in six days or that all our species were created instantaneously by God mm -hmm. or it wasn't some kind of macro process leading up to human, uh, sorry, leading up to animals. Yeah. It's just when it, when it, uh, which, which, which God did through that mechanism. I, I just say the red line when it comes to human beings. Uh, the Quran is very clear that God created Adam and, and Eve and um, by special creation. And I draw a red line at that. That is yeah. absolutely uh, evolution doesn't come into that. That's exactly the uh, Islamic position. And you've uh, interviewed a lot of people on that. But that is exactly the Islamic position is that the theology of Islam only requires belief in direct creation yeah. for the human being. As for frogs, giraffes, 
whatever you want to believe, it's yeah. you won't you're not going to be asked about that, right? You want to believe they came out of each other, or you want to believe that they were created just like Adam was created? It's up to you. But yeah. uh, uh, there's no theology or obligations on animals, giraffes, dogs, cats, and squirrels, and, and insects. Oh, the other. Another thing, by the way, about the you no know, design posts, uh, the pictures, is that they're intended deliberately, almost subliminally, to get at the fit, the fit, the, the fitna, uh, the, the the fitra, the fitna, uh, the, the fitra, the fitra. Yeah, the fitra. Yeah. Always get it mixed up. The yeah. fitra. It's supposed to trigger that at some yeah. level, even in the atheist, when mm-hmm. they see these marvels of creation. Clearly, they're designed. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. idiot, not it. But intellectually, they may not acknowledge that. But seeing a picture, not not an argument, yep. not, not a refutation, not a form of words uh, saying Darwin was wrong, but a picture mm-hmm. it, 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 it gets to one at almost a subliminal level yep. uh, of response. And that's why I think the what the Quran talks about the the picture is, is 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 so helpful there. Yeah, that's why the Quran says look so many times, and looking yeah. it moves emotion. And and emotion, it's not just an emotion, it's an awe. And you don't have awe out of accidents. Nobody is in awe of an accident. You're always in awe of something that's that was done right or done beautifully or done perfectly. Yeah. So the, the feeling of awe never comes about when viewing randomness. It always comes about when viewing something that deserves praise. Right, and and that's the that's the rationality about the Quran's mandate to look, keep looking and looking and looking. Yeah. Right, your your heart will tell you that there has to be some knowledge and life and will behind this. Yeah. And that's the motivation behind this is basically uh, uh, expressing the Quranic injunction, but in mm-hmm. terms of, of no design posts. So that, yeah. that, that that really is the, the, the what's going on there. Yeah. Now, if for those watching on Instagram, you can only see half of me and, and half of our guests. So hop over to YouTube, Safina Society, uh, and you can and you could watch the rest of this interview with both of us here. And you can comment, and we'll be taking some Q and A, open oh, really? Q and A, if our yeah. guest uh, uh, approves of no, that. I'm, I'm happy, long, long as they're not too difficult questions. Um, yeah, because <laughs> because your your interviews are always pre-recorded, right? There's no audience Absolutely. interaction. No, there's a reason. But I'll come to the reason why in a sec, if you want. But yeah. Okay, good. Now, today, for you, for you who have always been listening uh, to Blogging Theology, this is your chance to be able to talk, all right, to the interviewer himself. Now, let's go back about five years, and I remember we, you seeing you in different comments, right, and knowing that this is somebody who converted to Islam, and sometimes you ask a question or say a comment. Time passed, then didn't see you for some period of time, then, I don't know, I wasn't paying attention or maybe I was off social media for a period of time because sometimes I do go off. I come back and all of a sudden, blogging theology is a massive operation and your Twitter handle has gone through the roof. And I'm thinking to myself, what happened to this brother? He's just like uh, swallowed a Mario Brothers mushroom. You remember Mario Brothers? Like okay. swallowed the mushroom and now he's on fire. So what exactly transpired? Well, alhamdulillah, uh, uh, God transpired and um, uh, took me out of a, a fairly bad place uh, several mm. years ago, about th- three or four years ago. We won't go into that now, if you don't mind. <laughs> it oh, was ra- a rather d- difficult place in terms of uh, my, my dean and so on. And um, it was really during the lockdown in co- during COVID, actually, when I mm. found myself here in this place, uh, quite isolated, as, 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 as millions of people in Britain, in, in the world actually were, um, and uh, I, I, I came into some money and I decided, hey, why not buy a new MacBook Pro? You know, mm. flash out all this money. I didn't really need a, the top of the range MacBook Pro, but hey, I had the money, so I buy it anyway. And, and, and through that on YouTube, I thought, well, I'll make some videos because it's a way of making contact with the world out there, having some yeah. online interaction. I didn't really have, I had about, about 20,000, uh, sorry, 2,000 Twitter followers about mm-hmm. then, about 2,000. A little bit of interaction. I thought videos is really my medium much more. And um, so I just started to make a couple of videos, uh, I think, on, on Christianity, New Testament studies, biblical studies, historical Jesus, things that interested me, uh, drawing on the books behind me, my, my reading. And um, and that's how it started. It was very much my attempt to reach out during the, the isolation of COVID. But um, after a couple of months, um, 
something strange started to happen that the, the the subscriptions and interest started to take off but in a way that was quite unexpected so I, I would have several thousand new subscribers a day and um and then uh i after a while I, after a couple of months I, it was several months i thought it'd be really nice to have a guest Mm. Um, but there's no chance I'm going to get a scholar on because they don't know about me. And I'm not a scholar myself, of course. Uh, I don't have a PhD. So why would they come on? <laughs> so, uh, But nevertheless, I reached out to someone I quite liked, a guy called Sir Anthony Buzzard, who actually uh, was the head of uh, Atlanta College in Georgia in the United States. He's an Englishman, uh, and his father actually was head of naval intelligence during the Second World Whoa. War in the U.S. He's incredibly distinguished uh, lineage, uh, mm. distinguished guy himself. So I invited him on. So, hey, because he's a, he's a Unitarian Christian, you see. He's a Unitarian. So I thought, this is interesting. We can talk about Jesus. And uh, so I invited him. And amazingly, he said, yes. I thought, wow, this is a big coup. Nice. So he came on. And uh, we had such a good time. I mean, he's such a great guy. And, um, and we had a really good conversation about uh, New Testament Greek and Christology and historical Jesus, etc. And um, so that was like, that broke the barrier a little bit for me. And I thought, well, you know, I'd like to try someone else, but this time go for a top notch American a scholar that I, I knew of, a John Dominic Crossan, mm. uh, who was the head of the Jesus Seminar. He was a professor at DePaul University, one of the world's leading scholars. He's still, that both of these people are still very much with us and writing. And uh, amazingly, he said yes. Mm. Uh, and that really showed me that it was possible to seriously invite people. I had a track record then. I actually had people I invited, you know, and the videos were doing well. Yeah. So that was the beginning of um, my engagement with academics. Um, and my my philosophy, as still is my attitude, is I'm attempting to build a bridge uh, between the ivory tower, the world of academia, and the intelligent layperson who yeah. I have in my mind. This is my... Um, uh, and to get experts on who can explain their expertise in ways that which we can all understand. So I, I'm not just passively listening. I, I'm hopefully engaging in conversation, asking them to clarify what they mean. If they're difficult terms, I'll ask them to define what they mean. So th there is some input, but I'm there very much like the viewer as uh, a, a person who is benefiting from their expertise. Um, and it's been, a, a, I can't stress this enough, this has been a huge privilege for me to meet these people, including yourself, because you've been, alhamdulillah, a guest. Um, mm. And I can't stress how much a privilege it's been for me. And I've learned so much, uh, as have many other people, as, you, as you've alluded to before. I can imagine because uh, I watch uh, your Ali Atai videos. And those were like three hours. Part one and part two, and I think there's part three even. Um, yeah. These are like two and three hours. So I can imagine you basically are going to school for free, essentially, right? Yes, it, it's yeah. In that sense, it is. It's a free university. Uh, uh, Doctor Ali Atai is. Uh, I don't want to embarrass the guy. He's a friend of mine. I, I mm -hmm. met him in, in Zaytuna. He, he is such a talented man. Uh, yeah. uh, he's a poly, as a polymath, by which I mean he is actually expert in multiple subjects, including uh, biblical Hebrew, New Testament Greek, Arabic, mm -hmm. English, obviously Farsi, and he, he's expert on the Bible. Has a PhD in it and Islam. Yeah. And this is a unique, uh, well, not you, but it's a very rare uh, skill set. Um, but um, so, yeah, I, 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 a huge fan of his as well. And but when I was at Zaytuna back in February uh, uh, for several days, he invited me to sit in on one of his classes where mm. he was doing the theology of Judaism. And I thought, wow, what a, what a, what a yeah. privilege. I sat yeah. there, you know, my jaw dropped as I listened to this. And he is witty in his classes during mm -hmm. term time as he is like, in the rest of his life. He's actually yeah. very entertaining. I mean, he's, um, he's not at all boring. So your first few guests were these, these Christian scholars study that talk about Christology. So you have a, a deep interest in Christian theology. Absolutely. And, and is that something that was from your, from your, were you ever involved academically with that or is it all personal? Um, it's always been personal. I, I became a, a committed born again Christian when I, in my early twenties, an evangelical mm -hmm. actually, um, and I immediately took to reading the Bible. I loved the Bible. It became alive for me, the Word of God, and I believe it is inerrant. So I was a, a what many people call a fundamentalist uh, Christian, um, and that was both my strength and my weakness. The strength was I took the Bible very seriously, which we have to do in today's world, even now with events in in, in Palestine. The Bible is being used, of course, by many to weaponize oppression of people but but also because 
it, it is such an interesting book, actually. It's a library of books. Mm -hmm. But the problem was, and this is the downside of it, the more I read, the more I realized that there were problems, yep. big problems with the Bible, particularly the New Testament. And so this, this set me on a journey of, given my nature, of, of accessing biblical scholars in, in, in books to try and find answers. Mm -hmm. um, and that led me to uh, be an undergraduate uh, studying Christian theology at university. So I did study it academically, but I've always been interested in the Bible. Still, I'm still reading it now because it is, apart from the Quran, of course, the, mo the world's most important book. Mm -hmm. And it's been hugely influential on the Western tradition, the Western mindset. Even if people, even if people are secular, yeah. many of the categories of thought that they have and, and assumptions about reality are still rooted in parts of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really important to understand it anyway, even if you don't believe in God, it's important to understand it, I think. Can you share some of those things that you found to be start triggering your mind that there are some issues here? Yeah, I, I'm not going too, too technical. If you read the Gospels and then Paul's letters, um, if you read, say, the earliest Gospel of Mark, um, it becomes apparent in several places, like Mark chapter 13, that it looks like Jesus foretold the second coming, the end of the world, within the generation of people then living in the first mm. century. Uh, mm. And uh, Mark 13, 30, if you go and look it up now, you'll see all these things, it says, will happen within this generation. All these things refers to the preceding narrative, which includes the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and the return of the Son of Man on the clouds of glory. I thought this can't be right. Because firstly, yeah. the Bible that didn't happen, we're 2,000 years later. It also means Jesus made a mistake. That can't happen because Jesus is God, I believed. So I, off I went to read New Testament scholars, and I discovered something pretty startling. In the last couple of hundred years, uh, what's called eschatology, uh, which is this, this, the study of the end times, and the, the sense of imminent eschatology we see in the New Testament has been a central theme in New Testament scholarship. You know, what's the, the Bible, most scholars think, in, in some places, has got it wrong. Paul, for example, expects the end of the world within his own lifetime. But, but later writers don't. Luke doesn't so much. John doesn't so much. It's complicated because it's a library. Yeah. Um, but, th but th this shocked me. I thought, hang on, there shouldn't be any mistakes, especially not by Jesus. <laughs> um, so I, I went, I read, you know, uh, Tom Wright and N.T. Wright, and I go through a long list of people I read. Commentary, I, I've read over 50, at least 50, I stopped counting after a while, at least 50 academic commentaries on Mark 13 alone. Yeah. Um, and, and it's parallel passages, Matthew 24 and Luke 21, to try and find an answer to this thing, because it, I found it threatening to my faith. So uh, that, that was one example. There are many. Uh, you see, the problem is once you start reading scholarship, you discover other issues that I yep. wasn't aware of, which then became problems. In themselves. For example, the nature of the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. Um, and, and that was perhaps an even bigger threat. We're, we're mm. going to it's all academic stuff, but um, which your average Christian has no idea about. And yet all their scholars do. They know about these problems. So part of my job on BT, to some extent, has been to share what Christian scholars uh, have been saying about the Bible and share that with Christians. So uh, just so people understand, the Bible is not exactly the word is given to Jesus directly. It's Mark, Matthew, Paul. These Gospels are essentially uh, biographies, biographical accounts of Jesus. Yep. Okay, Absolutely. so uh, what yeah. we would call like Syrah narr narrations yeah. or narratives. Exactly. The Injil, the Gospel, uh, as the Quran calls it, it is the gospel given to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And actually the Bible says this too. If you look at the, say, Mark, you have, uh, and Jesus went around Galilee preaching the gospel. Yeah. So the gospel, it wasn't um, the message about Jesus or wasn't Christianity. It was the gospel. And if you want to know what it, you can read it in the gospels in the Bible today. So the, the four gospels don't even pretend to be revelation. They don't yeah. pretend to be inspired. Indeed, later gospel writers correct, alter, and amend and embellish earlier gospels so uh, mm. matthew and luke famously uh, correct mark on key points which is fascinating it's called redaction criticism in its own in own right yeah. but the gospel given to jesus what he preached is what muslims believe in and scholars have made this lovely distinction which is so important that there's the gospel of jesus and then there's a gospel about jesus that makes and sense yeah. about jesus is called christianity yeah. the gospel of jesus is what Muslims believe in. And if you look at the details, even in the Gospels we have now, you can see the themes are the same. Yeah. 
Uh, so now you got into this, you found some issues. Yep. I assume the evangelical tradition is very prejudiced against Islam and Im- yes. imbues in its people uh, an emotional reaction towards Islam. It's one of the greatest enemies. I just re- was listening to some uh, uh, a gentleman, very soft-spoken gentleman, but he was saying the great four abominations are uh, homosexuality, um, he listed two other things, and he listed Islam as one of the, the four great abominations to a Christian. Okay, So uh, oh, he said homosexuality, abortion, can't remember the third one, and then it was Islam was the fourth one. So were you also, did they imbibe that inside of you too, whoever the yeah. evangelicals that you were, you were keeping yeah. company with at the time? Well, to some extent, yeah. I mean, uh, 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 British evangelicalism is much more um, lukewarm, uh, less extreme than the American version. Uh, a lot of American evangelicals, we know who they are. They, they attack, uh, many of them attack Islam. British evangelicals tend to be more mild for some reason. Um, Everything about the British is more mild, right? Well, that's what we like to think. And, uh, <laughs> and um, except when it comes to supporting states like Israel, then we're quite yeah. happy to send them arms and give them political cover, which is yeah. not very mild at all. It's quite evil. Yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I agree. And um, I think one of the reasons, though, apart from racism, Islamophobia, just sheer bigotry, but there's actually a theological reason. And that these evangelicals believe that have a particular understanding of Christianity, which means that anything that comes after Christianity, in their view, uh, which denies, say, the divinity of Jesus, must be evil by definition, because it's denying a central truth of the Christianity. So they have a theological motivation, um, you know, as well. But they tend to obviously defame and speak evil of and lie, actually, I've noticed, uh, about Islam as well. So they make it they make their objections a lot worse than they could have been, I think. And so were you with a group or were you just going solo on this? Oh, no, I, that's the curious thing, really. Um, I, I never publicly uh, publicly ever expressed my views about Islam. I, I expressed my concerns to fellow Christians. I remember now um, well, a couple of them in my church um, who I did, you know, express my great alarm about Islam and Muslims, particularly in London here. Mm-hmm. Um, but I never expressed it on social media, nothing like that at all, no. So then you were with a group of people, and I don't want to say the word herd mentality, but that's usually what group mentality, we could say. Group mentality is very strong. When everyone in the group has the same kind of loves and hates, it's very strong to come out of that. So how did you eventually come out of that into eventually investigating Islam? Yeah, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a very interesting story, really, but it's, it's how I embraced Islam. So uh, 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 at some point, I became... Uh, quite Islamophobic, as I say, in, in my own mind. And I decided to, because I was just, I, I already had learned that the media, for example, often don't fairly represent positions which I knew were quite different. For example, on Christianity, I, I thought that often you get sort of misunderstanding. So I thought, well, maybe uh, we, we, I've misunderstood Islam. Uh, maybe the media, you know, I used to you read, I don't know, or watch the BBC or whatever, Daily Mail. or uh, And so I thought I'd investigate this. It's also very curious. I just wanted to learn more about Islam. So I bought a dreadful translation of the Quran and, uh, and, and that didn't work. I just couldn't, I couldn't even engage with the Quran at all. But I did then go to my local mosque here, Regent's Park Mosque, which is... Um, you know, the, the, uh, a pretty important mosque, actually, in, in Britain. I just walked through the door and I thought, look, I'll give myself three months. I'm going to talk to some Muslims, read some of their stuff. And then at least I would have made the effort to learn more about this religion, which I thought was profoundly wrong. Yeah. But, um, so I walked in the door there and on the right hand side, if you know, the mosque there's a bookstore. I thought, mm-hmm. Ah, books. I recognize those. So, you know, I went and um, s- some kind Muslim brother uh, bought me a, a, you know, a heap full of books. Uh, and, and a good translation of the Quran. And um, and that started me on a journey. I, I went back there. I uh, I argued with one or two Christi- uh, Muslims that I was a Christian. I believed in Christianity. Uh, and um, But over time, I discovered something I didn't, because of my evangelical prejudice and dogma, it's embarrassing to say this now, but I, I'm sure this is true of many evangelicals. I actually discovered that Islam has an incredibly deep uh, and rich spiritual tradition which easily rivals that of Christianity. So I knew in Christianity we had Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Beckett, you know, Julian of Norwich, the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, the, the amazing works of St. Augustine, 
etc etc but islam has a parallel spiritual tradition of equal profundity but like much much more of it actually mm -hmm. i mean without even going to like rumi and everything you know there's a huge tradition which goes back many 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 centuries and this really impressed me and, and i recognize commonalities and similarities between the two traditions actually and then I, I, I that kind of woke me up to a paradigm shift that i thought mm. hmm, hang on if if christian mysticism or spirituality can speak profoundly of the nature of god and our lives and islam is doing something quite similar in many ways maybe there's a lot of truth in islam mm -hmm. <laughs> um and then i and then i came across something which i didn't expect to find um which made the biggest impact on me other than reading the quran was the life of the prophet muhammad upon him be peace and i, I read the amazing sira by martin lings mm -hmm. and that blew my mind and i thought Ooh, okay 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 you know he looks like a prophet, talks like a prophet, speaks like a prophet, behaves like a prophet. Why am I not believing he's sent by God? And mm. then that was a revealing moment. Then I encountered the problem within myself. I knew that if I accept that he was a prophet, that would mean I would become a Muslim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that would mean a, a, a an existential change, a civilizational. I would cross over thresholds, red lines in my own life as a white male, middle class, majoritarian person in England, mm. moving over a small, often despised ethnic minority community. And that made me hold back for some months. I'm thinking, do I, really, do I actually really want to do this at all? Mm. Because I'm quite comfortable where I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> So alhamdulillah, I did ultimately get the courage by the grace of God to say the Shahada at Regent's Park Mosque. So you're, uh, this story, it's very intellectual. It's, it's between you and books. More so than, you know, there was a kind man on the street. And even like big intellectuals like Sheikh Noor Hamim Keller, he says that uh, he, was, he was moved into Islam by three things, all of them were interactions, one time, one moment interactions with regular Muslims on the street. Like one per, one woman saw he was so dusty and disheveled she and she was very poor and she took money from her pocket and put it in his hand, right? Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So, but yours seems to be between you and books and ideas and you're thinking on your own. I think, well, yeah, books, I think, yes, if, if in, if by that one means a, a, a deep engagement with truth. Yeah. I, I don't want it to come across as a cerebral exercise. Mm -hmm. It was in part, don't get me wrong, but um, it wasn't just that. It was a much deeper uh, transformative encounter with the truth, yeah. actually. And, and um, well, the, 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 great, the great, in fact, there's a book I read, and I'm always, always flogging this book, Islam, mm -hmm. The Destiny of Man by uh, the English writer Guy Eaton. When I started to read that book, I was I was a I was a, a convinced Christian. When I finished reading that book, I was a Muslim in my heart. Uh, intellectually, mm. I hadn't said so. I, it, the way he communicated the, a, a profound understanding of Islamic spirituality, the life of the Prophet, and the Quran, and the and the Islamic worldview. Once I, I let that really uh, let that impact me, it, it transformed me. Yeah, and um, so I, I wouldn't want by by a, a, a book conversion see it as a bookish girl. it wasn't it was much deeper than that you you're reading a lot uh are you a writer as well well i i i, I write tweets uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh do you have an actual blog with essays um i, I have actually written essays yes I, I don't tend to um i do yes okay uh, I, 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 yeah uh, i mean i have written uh, on some more academic stuff but i don't tend to do a lot of that because a lot of my time is spent with interviewing real academics so yeah. uh, i i feel that they, they should obviously be deferred to but uh yeah i do occasionally write things when people enter come in into islam uh, in our masjid i give them abdul halim you know professor abdul halim he's maybe 10 minutes from you right we're referring to this which is the yes. Quran, is i give them that because that is the easiest translation of the quran to read you know, I, I think this is the easiest now. This one, the clear, the clear Quran. The clear Quran. We we received. We somebody sent us a whole box of those, so we give them out now too. Okay. Um, you know what I don't give out though, and it bothers me to death. I we I don't have a one hundred page biography of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Every biography of the Prophet is very long. Okay, Karen Armstrong's is a good biography too. 
right? But it's not one of them, those that's readily available on Amazon. And I would like to give them a short biography. Now, you just said that one of your biggest turning points was the seerah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. You are a convert. You know your, 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 your people better than a born Muslim would know. Uh, what do you think of the idea of writing a 100-page biography of the Prophet for new Muslims? <laughs> well, I wasn't expecting that question. Um, I, I'm not the person to do that. I'm not qualified to do that. I, I think a, a prerequisite, although Karen, Karen Armstrong doesn't have this prerequisite, but she, she's unusual. The prerequisite for writing a biography of, of doing a serial would be knowledge of Arabic. Um mm-hmm. And I, I think uh, when I was in Hajj earlier this year, I read uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi's new uh, Sira, mm. um, which is very accessible and readable. Um, and so How many I think, pages? Um, I'm not a page fetishist. I think, uh, I don't know why like, we had to wait. Is it like this or this? Yeah, but you see, it really, I mean, it really depends how big the font is and how thick the yeah. pages are and how many words. I mean, that's deceptive. You can shrink the pages and by changing the font and the font size. So, True, yeah. Um, I, I, th- I think we have now, I mean, it's just my personal lay opinion. I think now in English, we have an abundance of Sira of excellent quality. And I'm also against just having one standard Sira. To, uh, I think it has to be, because there's such a choice now, if, if I had a quite, a, a, a quite an educated English lady or gentleman, you know, I'd recommend Martin Ling's. Okay? Yeah. I just would. Forget, forget all the others, however yeah. good they are. Because of the standard of language, the, the eloquence, the beauty of the language we find in Martin Ling's work. But I wouldn't recommend that to a lot of other people because it is quite challenging to read if you're not yeah. used to that kind of uh, old fashioned, if I can use that word, English. Um, so, but uh, yes, Akari, a much more wider audience, I think, uh, much more demotic. Um, and you know, Karen Armstrong, again, for, if I had a Christian, I would say, well, read Karen Armstrong because she's not a Muslim. Yeah. And yet she manages to convey successfully an awful lot of facts and truth about the prophet in a way that isn't prejudiced. I don't agree with everything. She has one or two bits where she gets a bit... Anyway, but she's very, very good. Yeah. So, you know, it, it depends on who, who one is speaking to in terms of recommending a particular seerah. Yeah. Do you see non-Muslims and Christians now and and ever have a in-person dawah type of uh, relationship with them? Yeah, all, all the time. And where would where is the where's the platform for that? Is it like a speaker's corner thing or yeah. yeah. I mean last Sunday, a couple of days ago, I had a a long conversation which was filmed, you can see it on YouTube with a an American missionary. Um mm, mm, interesting. and <laughs> and uh that was difficult for me because the how can I put it, the asymmetry in knowledge between yeah. the two of us was uh, pretty extreme. Um but you can make up your own mind what happened there. And then another American from California uh, who says he's a fan of blogging theology, who says, I'm not sure I believe him really, but he said he came to London just to meet me. I um, do. uh, you don't. And um, because um, anyway, he, he, he was very different. He was very intelligent, very respectful and, and, and patient. I, I, was, his, I was very happy to talk to him indeed. And we did for an hour or so. That's also on, on YouTube uh, from last Sunday. Um, and his questions were much more scholarly uh, and technical, and I find those much more interesting, actually. A lot of people of us in the Dawa world, in the YouTube world, will know about Speaker's Corner, but can you tell uh, those who don't what is Speaker's Corner and why it has a role in Dawa? Gosh, that's a good... Yes, it, indeed it does, actually, um, for good or ill. Mm-hmm. So uh, Speaker's Corner, so-called, is in London, in England, and it's part of a, a park, a public park called Hyde Park, literally a mile from where I'm sitting. It takes me 20 minutes to walk down there, which is why it's so easy for me just to get down there on a Sunday. I only meets on one day a week on a Sunday. Um, and it's not there because the park authorities are being nice or the police want you to turn up or anyone. It's there by law in the 19th century during the convulsions of... of uh, uh, so when the trade union movement was, was beginning in, in, in England, um, many uh, militant workers who were struggling for their rights and recognition and social justice uh, demonstrated in this park. And, and uh, at the beginning, they were quite brutally suppressed by the police. So the government, this parliament decided to, to pass a law to set aside that area of the park where speakers could actually speak with, with complete freedom without the police arresting them, without anyone interfering. So it's actually there by statute. Mm. So police can't close it down or anything, except, except for really, really good reasons. Like during COVID, sadly, it was closed briefly. So um, 
So people have been going there, obviously, for years. Karl Marx went there. Um, uh, Oswald Mosley uh, went there. Uh, who, who else? Um, George Orwell, the famous uh, writer, went there. Lots of very famous people. Uh, Lenin went there, actually. He's on record. He lived in London for a while and went to Speaker's Corner. You hear Lenin's. Can you imagine? Mm. Um, so, but in recent years, it's become, because of the local demography and other reasons, it's become quite heavily Muslim, and put it that way. And also with the advent of uh, social media and, and cameras and uh, iPhones like my, you know, uh, people have started to upload recordings of yeah. people there. And and now I'm told uh, in, in the world, you know, there are hundreds of millions of people who, who have watched videos there. They're translated into or subtitles into Arabic. Um, and it's made celebrities out of something like, like Shamsi, the, the Salafi um, speaker there is very, very well known. Uh, I can go through a long, long list of people, but whether it be uh, Mohammed Hijab or, you know, who've been there and still go there, actually. Um, but I would say mainly I would say it's toxic. I would say mm. mainly it's bad because there's often not much positive discourse going on, let alone doubt. Or often it can be quite uh, particularly with some of the even some of the Christians there are, um, are are very, very extreme and they will insult the prophet uh, and so on so you really have to be tough skinned and not take offense at least not react anyway because uh it's protected by law so how does this work exactly so like from as soon as the the the, the daylight is up people start going there randomly and picking a corner and taking a an area and making it theirs and speaking yeah, I mean, I say it's just a corner of the park. So there's no like gate or entrance fee or a policeman saying, hey, we started. Um, it takes place on Sunday by tradition. Mm -hmm. So people just turn up at some point. On, I think you could turn up before. The thing is, if you turn up before dawn on a Sunday, you could do that. But I wouldn't imagine anyone would be there. Mm -hmm. So I usually turn up about two to three o'clock in the afternoon when you get most people have arrived. And then because I have a number of friends there who I just like to chat to anyway. So there's a social side to yeah. it. And like this Sunday just gone, I I, I uh, met two American. Uh, uh, one was a missionary, the other one was an inquirer. And uh, particular latter, he appro people approach me, um, and sometimes I, I, I you know listen uh, um, as well to discussions or debates. Um, and you can you can learn there can be some quite uh, good debates and discussions sometimes. Do you so see uh, Shahad is that all there? No, no, I, I would say that's quite rare. Um, ironically, there's a lot of DAO work going on on the streets of London, actually, mm. an awful lot. And I can tell you because I've seen it myself many times. It is hugely successful. Uh, I mean, just up the road from here, about a mile north in Kilburn, there's a DAO store that's been going for years. You, you get you get numerous shahada every uh, all the time. It's amazing, actually, uh, just from the general public. But Speaker's Corner is different. <laughs> and I think it's because it's such a toxic, toxic atmosphere. You can't really have, it's very difficult to have a, a good heart to heart, an authentic yeah. interaction with human You're there to, uh, you know, refute the missionaries. The missionaries are there to destroy Islam or whatever, yeah. you know, this is not really the right place. And and are they, uh, there? so there's no prayer there. So there's no Christian group that's setting, that's praying and you get to witness their prayer and then a Muslim group witnessing their prayer that that doesn't exist. It does, no, a prayer, no, Christians that uh, Muslims do pray in, in, in pray Salah in congregation, but there's an area very, very, very close to it where the police have said, you know, you can, you're not supposed to pray in the, the speaker's corner because, okay. uh, because a huge part you can pay anywhere, but it, it because it, 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 it um, kind of interferes with the smooth running of speaker's corner. Really. I see. Good. Now l let's get to your YouTube uh, channel. Mm. How many interviews are you on right now? What what number of interviews is, is good? I have next no one? idea. I have no idea. I, it's nearly a thousand videos, but I, I would imagine, at a very rough guess, about half of those, probably or more than half, are actual videos. Uh, you interviews, I mean. So you started with the Christian uh, scholars. Yeah. Who was your first Muslim interview? Gosh, do you know, I don't know the answer to that. Mm. I'd need to check. <laughs> um, I mean, I can check now, but I I, uh, I I don't remember. I'm just scrolling through my old stuff now and uh, just trying to find an answer. But I, I don't know the answer to that. No, no um, problem. No problem. Uh, so oh, oh, hang on, hang on. Um, Ali Atai. Actually, I've got a video here. Ali Atai discusses Isaiah 53 and James and Paul. That was two years ago. Oh, wow. So wow. He might have been 
Uh, oh, the truth about Salafi is revealed. I interviewed a, a Salafi, Sheikh Hassan Somali. He's actually an American who lives in the state, I think Pennsylvania. Um, but although he's actually British originally, mm -hmm. uh, Ali Atai before, I think Ali Atai was the earliest, uh, surprisingly. So some of these, uh, some of these interviews are actually, or sorry, sorry, some of your videos are not interviews. They're like compilations that oh, you yeah. made. Like deputy mayor uh, of Jerusalem calls for genocide. When I click on that, I'm going to oh, get like a, a compilation and your commentary. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I do. Yeah. There, there are several kind of categories of, of thing uh, of stuff work that I do that has mm -hmm. kind of evolved naturally, organically over the last couple two two years. And so obviously there are the set piece uh, interviews, which um, I, I I really like. And then the other another category is. Um, Kind of my own social commentary so mm -hmm. if an event happens or you know, like you mentioned I, I will uh try and think of you know that i feel it i actually want to comment on um and they're usually much shorter say 20 minutes half an hour um yeah very good uh if you're on instagram or uh, or you're just joining us on youtube our guest is paul williams out of London, uh, he, he runs a website, a, a YouTube channel called Blogging Theology, where mm -hmm. he has interviewed numerous, numerous uh, Christian and Muslim scholars, and he has clips. He's got a very, very successful YouTube channel, uh, and he also has a very successful uh, a, a Twitter handle. So check it out at Blogging yeah. Theology or, or at Paul Williams, Free Monotheist on Twitter. Yeah. Your, your Twitter handle is called Free Monotheist. His channel on YouTube is called blogging theology if you're on instagram hop over to youtube so you can see the full picture uh let me ask you this question what is your criterion when you invite one of your guests uh what's the criterion there what's the thought pattern behind that um it depends on the guests i have a number of guests and that i see regularly mm -hmm. now dr ali yeah. is one of them so we're in contact on whatsapp and um you know he may come up with an idea or i might invite him uh, on to discuss a particular subject. And Dr. Louis Fatui is another one. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a kind of a group of, of, of people who kindly come on periodically, at least. Um, but other than that, um, perhaps a, a bigger source is my own reading. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, I come across authors and books that I, I've really appreciated and would love to speak to the author of those said books. So I just simply email them actually and say, yeah. hi, can you, do you want to come on? And a lot of the time they say yes, some of the time they say no. You've had Ali Atai, you, you had a lot of Muslims, obviously. You've had uh, you discussed uh, the, the, um, a lot of biblical things with him, Judaism with him. Have you had any rabbis on? Yes, uh, just when well, I had two, actually. Rabbi Tovia Singer, mm -hmm. uh, who is based in Jerusalem now, um, he, he has been hugely popular amongst Muslims. He, he's, he's another genius when it comes to uh, dealing with Christian missionaries and their misrepresentations of the Torah. Um, mm. I mean, when I say genius, I mean, he's not only technically masterful with Hebrew, but he, his ability to communicate clearly and uh, intelligently uh, on the issues is very, very special. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I had him on. And um, there's another academic in uh, New York, uh, a professor there who's embarrassingly a name I can't remember. Uh, I, I had him on once a couple of years ago. Um, he, he's a proper academic who, who discussed uh, Judaism. Yeah. There is a uh, Hasidic uh, Jewish rabbi from the Setmar, uh, you're familiar, if you're not, for those not familiar with the Setmar Jews, they live in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, and they're very insular. They don't, they right. don't engage a lot in the world, but they're also very deeply uh, anti-Zionist, and they believe the entire project of Israel is sinful uh, and has nothing to do with Judaism and is a hijacking of Zionism. This is based upon their, the ancient, or not ancient, I should say, the, uh, Maybe three generations ago, their rabbi Teitelbaum from Austria, who who had this belief, they came uh, to, uh, to to Williamsburg in Brooklyn after the uh, Holocaust, and they set up shop here. We're trying to interview somebody. I think you'd also love to talk to him if you watch the videos of Yaakov Shapiro. He's yeah. one of the most thoughtful rabbis. He communicates excellently, and he's from the Satmar tradition. Mm -hmm. And he it distills and explains very clearly why is it that these Jews feel that Zionism is in fact against the Torah and is it, sinful in its nature. 
Exactly. And in fact, it, it remains a historical fact, something Ali Atai has mentioned quite correctly, is that until relatively recently, far the vast majority of Orthodox Jews were also, also anti-Zionist. Yeah. It's relatively recently that there's been this huge conversion amongst uh, Jews generally to be yeah. very militantly pro-Zionist. This wasn't the case. Mm. Uh, it was seen as a heresy, a, a, as a false idea by most Jews. Uh, and so that because it, once you, obviously once the, the state of Israel was founded and so on, uh, and after that, things began to change. But the, the idea itself was seen as completely un-Jewish. Mm -hmm. If you imagine, uh, to, to bring this closer to Muslims, imagine if the whatever the reform progressive uh, or Muslim organization out there or that group of people, these like totally reformed, totally progressive Muslims, they're not that many, but they make a lot of noise online. They seem to disappear every once in a while. In England itself, you had... Uh, Brilliant. The, Quilliam Foundation. They weren't, they weren't a Muslim organization, but they were dominantly very liberal. Very, very liberal. liberal. And they all disappeared. In fact, one of them actually made Toba and is now a Naqshbandi in, in Malaysia, really? right? Which is good for him. Uh, yeah, what's his name? Um, the, 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 the Pakistani uh, gentleman. What was his name? I can't remember his name. He was very provocative, extremely provocative, right? Sure. Liberal. Yeah. But he's made Toba to Allah. He has a sheikh now, and he's he, he's a Naqshbandi in Indonesia and Malaysia, so that's good for him. The others, they disappear. They always disappear in Islam. But let's yeah, say hypothetically. Yeah, they do, don't they? It's really odd. Yeah, they always disappear. Um, imagine those people set up a state hmm. and it called it, you know, Darul Islam. And not like we need one, right? But just hypothetically. Not, not, I'm saying that most there are tons of Muslim countries already, but hypothetically they set up, this is going to be a land where our chief goal is Islam, which of course is a wonderful idea, right? Uh, when I say I don't need one, I, I mean like we have so many countries, not that such a country wouldn't be a great idea. But imagine this type of idealistic Muslim nation, was, but it was run by reforms, reform Muslims. Okay, mm. these li liberal types. Mm. Your average Muslim and your average Imam and Sheikh, they dismiss it outright, right? Mm. Mm. And this is exactly what's happening uh, with a lot of rabbis in the earlier times, probably fewer now, but the bulk of rabbis, the Satmar types, the Natura Karta types, which are they're a little bit more extreme even, and people disagree with their activism rabbis jews themselves but uh even anti-zionist jews disagree with their activism but nonetheless that used to be the main uh, mainstream position is that this whole thing is sinful and yeah. is against the torah yeah that's true yeah so i i recommend you check out check out yaakov shapiro thank you yeah, you're gonna sure. love his work right sure. you're gonna love his lectures you know who had him on is the dean show eddie from the dean show oh right yeah, yeah he had him on you had him on all right but now i want to ask you about some Converts that you had and you interviewed Ahmed Keeler. Mm. Ahmed Keeler, uh, tell us about him a bit. Age of Crisis. Oh. Uh, yep, let me just uh, turn around here. Um, looking for the book. There we go. I knew it was here somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, the, <laughs> Rethinking Islam and the West: uh, A new uh, a new narrative for the age of crises. Crises. Um, yeah. Not a not a very. Um, you know, it doesn't draw me in that title. But when I actually read the book, um, I, I really appreciated the, the uh, a fantastic book. And I had mm -hmm. the privilege of interviewing him at Cambridge University on that. You can see it on the channel. Um, and uh, a very important work. Uh, and I do recommend it. Without going into all the details. But he, yeah. he knows his stuff. And uh, uh, he does offer a, a profound paradigm, um, the Nizan paradigm, for, uh, you know, a, a, as a vision to pursue, if you like. And what was his claim to, to fame? Was he a, a diplomat or? No, no, no. That was Guy Eaton. He was a diplomat. Uh, mm. he, he was a visiting fellow at uh, Cambridge University. So, uh, oh, he's a professor. Okay. No, uh, a fellow. I, a I fellow. I'm pedantic okay. now. But <laughs> Close. Yeah. yeah. All so, right. So um, w w do, you, do you have um, an episode that sticks out in your mind the most from one of your interviews? No, you see, there's so many jewels, if I may say so. It's not because of me, because of the guests. It's difficult to have uh, one that sticks out the most. But there are there are some, I think, rightly uh, very significant one or two videos, actually, mm -hmm. which have raised eyebrows. And um, what, what one of them it features a, a guy called uh, Keith Ward, um, who's a, a Church of England priest, uh, also happens to be a professor of uh, uh, 
Christian theology at Oxford University, uh, and mm -hmm. he's also a philosopher. He's also pr probably Britain's most senior Christian theologian, very famous, hugely accomplished, written more books than I've had hot dinners, um, a great guy. And I've had him on several times, bless him. It's been a great privilege to talk to him. Anyway, when I first, I, I, I've been reading his stuff ever since I was a Christian, uh, actually. I was familiar with his work, and that's why I invited him on, because I wanted to talk to him about, I had lots of questions. So I invited him on, he graciously came on. Now, I already knew, because of the kind I, I knew from his books, that he actually did believe that Muhammad, upon him be peace, okay. was a prophet. He actually mm. did. I knew that. He was a bit pluralist. So, um, nevertheless, I, 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 he's such a great guy. And I, I, he's an idealist. In philosophy. He's a philosopher who's an idealist. So I, that's a technical term in philosophy, uh, you know, following Bishop Berkeley and others. And, and I really wanted to talk to him. Anyway, he came on and I asked him the question, do you think Muhammad is a prophet of God? He said yes. Uh, and and then I had the thought, I'm not sure why, do your colleagues, by, by which I meant, of course, his Christian philosopher colleagues and Christian theologian colleagues, what do they think? Because I thought it'd be interesting to know how many of those might be sympathetic or not to Islam. He said, oh, no, they, they all or virtually all of them think he's a prophet of God. Wow. And I thought, what? Did I hear <laughs> you? Right? And, I, and I had to suppress my reaction because uh, I, it was such a startling thing for him to say. Um, and such a significant thing for him to say, because what it meant is that, if I can put it this way, that the Christian ulama in the West have conceded the point. SubhanAllah. That Islam is from God, that Muhammad was sent by God. Um, you know, we've had, what, 1400 years of civilizational com conflict or tension mm -hmm. uh, where the West has insisted it's, it's right and so on. But they, they, their, own, their own intelligentsia have now accepted that Islam is right. That's amazing. Um, mm. I mean, the parallel would be as if the Saudi ulama suddenly decided that Jesus was crucified yeah. son of God for their sins. I mean, yeah, exactly. Absurd. That would never happen. Yeah. Um, but so that was extraordinary. And you can't question what he says. He, he, he is, you know, he's actually a Regis professor. You get ordinary professors and then you get the elite professors who are appointed wow. directly by the king or the queen in his case who are called Regis professors. Mm. So he, he is a very senior academic. Uh, and um, so in other words, he knows everyone in the field. Yeah. So he, he is able to make that. Uh, and, and no one's ever contradicted it. No one's texted me or written to me saying, Paul, this isn't right. So, the, uh, but the question is, the two questions, why do they say this? And secondly, why isn't he a Muslim? Yeah. Uh, I asked him this. So why do they think this? Because these guys, when you get to know them a bit through their works, most of them are very honest. I mean, they are real scholars. You don't get to be an Oxford professor unless you have something going for you. you know? Yeah. So um, they've looked at the other other religions, often like Islam or Hinduism or Judaism, and you know they've read the texts and, and responsible scholars, and they have seen the likeness. They've they, they know about Moses. They also know about Muhammad, and they can see how similar they are, uh, and and they are of the same type. They both come from the same place, arguably. So yeah, they they get it because they're experts on it. So that's why I think they all get it, because they've looked mm -hmm. at the evidence. Why they're not Muslims is a much more complicated, dark question. I don't have an I, I asked Professor Keith Gore why, and he gave his answer. I didn't really understand it. It's to do with, well, I've been brought up in this tradition, and it's fine. It's a way to God, and I recognize Islam as a way to God. And didn't, I mean, you know, hey, that's his answer, but... Yeah, that's didn't... usually the uh, uh, one way to go about it. I'm having a discussion with with the Christian gentleman right now. Um, and I really basically said to him, look, I'm a simple guy, hypothetical. I just, I'm, a, I'm born Muslim and I follow the prophet, peace be upon him. All I want to know is if I continue doing this for the rest of my life and I meet God, okay, is he going to be pleased with my decision to follow the prophet or am I going to be in trouble? Am I going to find myself in trouble with God at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. Okay with this decision and I'm asking him in his theology, like in your Christian belief, am I wrong about this? Uh, ultimately at the end of the day, he had to admit that God doesn't punish you if you make the wrong decision. Okay. At that point, well then what is the purpose of being right then? <laughs> right? <laughs> like if the wrong, if making the wrong decision if Has getting no the wrong problem. answer doesn't get yeah. you right marked wrong, yeah. why do I study? What's the point of anything? What's the point of the whole class if marking the answers wrong on the exam? 
so d- d- does he represent the evangelical view correctly that um, there is no clear cut line that God says, if you follow any prophet after Jesus, you will be in trouble with me on the yeah. day of judgment. The evangelical would never agree with that. They would always say, if, if you, yeah, that they would say that Jesus was the, the, the final last prophet. Um, even though he said in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 15, I've only been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And according to Matthew called a Gentile woman, a dog, a Cain like woman. It's wow. there in Matthew 15. If you, not familiar with it i'm not saying this is historical by the way a lot of the gospels we now know is not historical but nevertheless you know he is presented as someone who's only sent to the jews in that regard i think it's historical why it makes sense of the historical context and the quran confirms that um but certainly for evangelicals if you followed muhammad you'd be going to hellfire absolutely mm-hmm. uh, these days i i really want to engage with others right i i i see that this war has actually caused so many people to be talking about things that we're interested in. They're talking about Judaism. They're talking about Christianity. They're talking about Islam. Uh, Christianity in the sense of Christian Zionism. The Christians are very amped up about mm-hmm. Israel. Uh, mm-hmm. Islam and Muslims are it's constantly in the forefront. So I'm taking this an opportunity to talk, and I talk to a lot of, um, a lot of Christians and a lot of right-wingers, usually deep in their threads on Twitter. Right. What's your advice on how to interact with those types of Christians mainly evangelicals, mainly very worried about immigration and things like that. What's your advice on how to interact with them? Uh, my advice would not be to interact them, with them on Twitter, really. It's, uh, it's mm. not really the right, the right forum for um, decent interaction, you know, human, uh, compassionate, intelligent, because so much communication between individuals and human beings is nonverbal. Yeah. And, yeah. and Twitter is a, a highly kind of selective a slice of reality and it is easy amenable to, you know, uh, so I think it's a terrible medium for that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that, um, the, the key thing is to show, uh, I know it might sound very basic, but many, many people are, are, I have certainly in the past forgotten basic principles, which I should have remembered and try and remember now. Yeah. And, and when talking to evangelicals, and it's going to sound very, very silly what I'm about to say, but I really believe in this. The first thing is be polite, actually. Uh, I, I've seen some Muslims, not many, thank goodness, but some Muslims just go in there and attack people, Christians. No, be polite. Say hello. Introduce you. Give you give me your name. I, I know this sounds very basic, but surprisingly how often I forgot to do that. Yeah. Um, so be polite and, and at least try and listen to what they're saying, even though you may, you may be repellent or completely wrong. And, and so, you know, maintain the eye contact, try and show them some respect because they're human beings after all. And because often what wins people over is not... I mean. I mean, this is going to sound extremely arrogant. It is arrogant, but I'm going to say it anyway. I might regret saying this. It's easy for me to win an argument with a Christian, usually mm. an average Christian. It's mm. not difficult. You know, I, I know the Bible better than they do. It's, it's just a fact. I, it's noticed as an average Christian, not a professor from Oxford. But I can win an argument and lose the person just as easily. You know, w- winning yep. the person over is absolutely a different thing entirely. So 100%. winning the intellectual argument is nothing. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what proofs I come out with, arguments, what biblical verses, what facts is irrelevant. If I attack that person, they get defensive, and then mm-hmm. they retort with some ridiculous statement, and we become alienated over. So I've yeah. done that. I've been there, and I behave like that uh, a number of times. I try and avoid that because it, it's 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 bad. Oh, the yeah. other thing, which you know as well as I, better than I, is that our job is not to convert anyone. It, it's it's God who changes hearts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so we, we must move away from the response the sense of responsibility that I must convert this person yeah, and yeah, change yeah. them. You know, that's not our job. It's not yeah. even journalists may think it's their job for them, but it's not our job. Our job is yeah. simply to share knowledge, share facts, and mm-hmm. then leave the rest to God. And God will convert them if He wants. Yep. Uh, let's uh, take three questions, audience. This is your chance uh, to talk to. Uh, the interviewer himself, Paul Williams from Blung Theology. Uh, you know, his videos are usually recorded, pre-recorded, and they're put out there, so there's no back and forth. I'm going to take two or three good okay. and brief questions uh, somewhat related to what we've been talking about uh, from the audience. We have about 400 to 500 people watching here. 
because we have here, we're on Instagram and we're on Facebook. So bring your questions. If you're on Instagram, bring it. You can put it on Instagram. If you're on Facebook, put it on YouTube or Instagram. He's not checking the Facebook right now. Facebook is nothing other than now a glorified Craigslist, if you ask me. Yeah, um, exactly. The Facebook marketplace is the only thing going for it, if you ask me. But um, here... And, oh, sorry, I just insulted. We got a Facebook engineer sitting right here. You need to go in there, dynamite the whole thing, and start over. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are, are, you, uh, are you on Facebook at all? Yeah, uh, but I have a Facebook uh, group called Blogging Theology, not surprisingly. I have a private, I'm on my own Facebook for me, but uh, the main one, Blogging Theology, is on there, yes, for sure. You find it useful? Uh, it's not really for me. I I, I I I have it as a service to share my own content, but okay. it, it's, it's it's closed. But you can join it. In other words, it's, it's to avoid trolls getting in and just trashing the place. But Makes sense. Get, yeah. Yeah. I, I I used to be a huge Facebook fan, and I used to be on it all the time, but over the years, it just got so convoluted and it just never adapted, and I feel that Twitter is just completely left it in the dust. Everyone's on Twitter. Right? I agree. I agree. Mm-hmm. All right, um, here is a question for you. Okay. What's my favorite color? Wow. <laughs> Mus- oh, here's a question okay. for you. Do you think Muslims should boycott Pierce Morgan's show <laughs> from going on the show? I guess he means going on the show. Oh, yeah. Should Muslims not go on the show? I'm going, to, I'm going to say something that's going to be slightly um, uh, embarrassing and awkward, uh, really, because uh, I do have a view on this. And several people have been on are actually friends of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I don't mean to criticize what their, their decision. However, I do think absolutely. We, we've had some big guns going on that program, uh, uh, whether it be Mohammed Hijab. I noticed Abdullah Andalusi, another friend of mine, was on there last night. My personal view is we don't need any more Muslims going on. Piers Morgan is a bigot. He's an Islamophobe. He doesn't learn. I don't mind people being bigots if, if when their errors are pointed out, they go, do you know you have a point? I'll change my mind. But he doesn't. He's a bigot, you know, you know, he's just a, a bigot. So we, we shouldn't waste our time being his his kind of, I, I don't know, setups for him to exercise his, his vile evil views i mean he's, yep. you know the way he treats muslims compared to the way he treats the israeli ambassador for example or israeli spokesman appalling yep. man boycott him but yep. I'm, I'm not saying those who's been on so far shouldn't have been on but i think we should certainly not go on ever again yeah That's we my- wouldn't we wouldn't have known the level of uh, or his real attitude towards things if they hadn't gone on and it, what it seems to be it's like his uh his material on the show, besides that, it gets, you know, a unique set of viewers every time he has a new guest. Yeah. But it seems to be like the fodder for uh, a slug fest on Twitter afterwards. Every single guest of his and him end up yeah. yelling at each other on Twitter. Exactly. It's, it's very, very uh, un- unwholesome. Uh, yeah. And I remember recently uh, another friend of mine, uh, 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 Dr. Um, your name is, is uh, Dr. Abdul Wahid. Sorry, that's yeah. my name. Uh, uh, who who was uh, stating the fact that you know, g- given how bad he, um, Piers Morgan thinks Islam is, why are so many women? Why are most converts to Islam women? Yeah. And I think Piers Morgan, I, I heard him say it. You know, oh, they they they, they, they obviously like imp- oppressing themselves. Yeah. Now this is uh, just sheer stupidity and bigotry, and the fact yeah. that he's even defend. I've seen on Twitter afterwards he's been roundly criticised, yeah. rightly so, by numerous people, but he's still defending what he said and and that shows me he's a bigger that i can't have any respect for as opposed yeah. to a bigger who actually listens and then changes his mind yeah. uh you know we, we all make mistakes but this guy just entrenches uh his ignorance and and that's just he should be kicked off tv in my yeah. view and i think he's also basically a wing of corporate media he's between corporate and 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 the new media or free media but because when he has an Israeli ambassador or, or, or Ben Shapiro, it's like with, with mittens he treats them, right? I know, I know. And there's never some kind of, there's never a controversy and there's never a fight on Twitter afterwards. Yeah. So That's probably should ignore him. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was a good question. Yeah. Here's another question about your knowledge of uh, Christian theology. Christians believe that Christ himself is the temple. Okay. Is it blasphemous for Christians to believe in the third temple, the rebuilding of another temple? 
well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Christian, so I can't pronounce on what's blasphemous for Christians to believe. You know, that's a Christian issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think believing in Jesus as son of God or God is blasphemous. But, you know, what I mean, um, but it's not my job to pronounce that uh, uh, to people uh, when you're doing dower. I mean, oh, your view is a blasphemous. You know, mm-hmm. no, that's not quite how we do it. Um, the idea of the third temple is not is not normal Christian theology, but it is very popular in recent years amongst so-called Christian Zionists. Uh, most of them are in, in your country, actually, in yep. America for some reason. Yep. Um, so the vast majority of Zionists are actually Gentiles. They're not Jews. Yep. Uh, they're, they're Christians. That's true. I mean. yep. And um, uh, Ali Atai has spoken incredibly eloquently about this whole phenomenon of Christian Zionism on, on, on my channel, and uh, mm-hmm. presumably elsewhere as well, of course. Um, and it is a very strange belief looking that, that somehow God will bring back the third temple when he's already abolished it. <laughs> Um, the second temple in AD 70, according to the, the letter of Hebrews, which is a letter in the New Testament, mm-hmm. uh, which is all about this kind of thing, about the how the Christian dispensation has fulfilled, or overtaken or replaced the Jewish dispensation. Yep. The idea that you can bring back the Jewish dispensation mm-hmm. uh, in an eschatological uh, uh, setting is is really unbiblical. It, it has yep. no place in Christian theology. It's really weird, actually. But uh, it, it's gained this new cu- this currency because of in just in recent. It's just like Jewish support for Zionism is a new thing. Mm-hmm. Christian support for Zionism is a new thing. Yeah. And I, I think what's really going on. This is my opinion. I could be wrong. What's really going on behind this uh, is, uh, is, is Israel as itself anti-Muslim, pro-Western position. Yeah. And so many Christians like Israel because it's very anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic, explicitly. Yeah. So. I mean, I saw the, I saw on Sky News earlier this evening the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom state in an interview on Sky News um, that she's abs- there's absolutely no hope of a, of, a, of a two-state solution. No hope, okay? Mm. Um, and she referenced in passing uh, about the Palestinians as in general, how radical they were. This is why she, they can't be a two-state solution because they're radical. This is all of the Palestinians. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this idea of the radical palace, this all feeds in beautifully with a, a yep. Islamophobic narrative you find in the West, in the United States, obviously, and in Europe to some extent yep. as well. So I can see why Christ- many uh, fundamentalist Christians would support Zionism because it ultimately is anti-Islamic and it fits yep. in with their agenda. Uh, you, it, Palestine and Israel, the population is 50-50. Um, Countries like Denmark, uh, France, England, they're also complaining of the rising population of Muslims. So they seem to each other have uh, similar grievances, and that's why they're uh, really echoing the same emotions and the same sentiments. I see these circles, they're all constantly like a Venn diagram. They're overlapping heavily in that yeah. regard. Yeah. yeah. All right, here's the next cu- question. This is from a gentleman by the name of Mark Ward. He says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What was the most difficult interview for you? And I did see someone else comment and asked something about your interview with William Lane Craig. Um, could you comment on your most inter- difficult interview? Well, this is difficult. I mean, I've got to be careful here because some of these, well, these have been my guests. And they might be guests again. I don't want yeah. to criticize them publicly because it's not appropriate. I do so. But I will co- co- comment on one because... Um, I will, because I don't really mind if he gets offended because he, he behaved badly. Uh, Professor Bar Ehrman, uh, who is a biblical scholar, is one of the great biblical scholars today, in my view, and in view of many people. I invited him on and we did two interviews. Uh, one was um, on New Testament scholarship and so on. We had a great time, fantastic interview, loved it. Fantastic. We were, we were on the same wavelength, he and I, and we were just... Uh, playing off it. it was a fantastic interview and he enjoyed it he wrote an article about it on his website really enjoyed it fantastic he also separately did um and something i'd set up uh, uh had a debate uh discussion um w- with a, a, a chap called dr brown um in um he is a, a muslim living in saudi arabia uh he's an eye specialist an eye doctor mm. And um, the debate was on um, was set up to be a discussion between a Muslim and an atheist. So Bart Ehrman representing atheism, and Bart Ehrman behaved badly. I mean, he just did. Uh, I mean, it was so bad that you know there's, that no one could dispute the fact. And he actually apologised afterwards, and mm. uh, not on camera, but to me. But um, 
he behaved badly. And um, it was it was embarrassing because uh, I didn't know what to do. I, I mean, when you have two sort of eminent people, I'm not there like a school teacher to tell them to behave themselves. Yeah. So I was hoping that, that he would, but um, he was he was very aggressive. Uh, he kept on, uh, he made mocking comments to Dr. Brown, very dismissive and, and didn't take seriously the, uh, I thought, the discussion. And and that was very, very unfortunate, actually. And that was the worst one. I don't, I mean, you know, if Bart Ehrman's watching this, he probably isn't, of course, but, you know, I, I, it's just the way I saw it. And I think he, he did, he did acknowledge that he behaved yeah. badly afterwards. So you were the moderator of that debate? Well, uh, moderator is too strong a word. I, I was hosting it, really. I, mm. I was trying to steer two, two bright guys in a, hopefully, I read discussion towards, you know, elucidating what the issues were and hopefully showing Bart that, you know, Islam was a serious tradition and, and the personalities were very different. And I think it was a mistake to put them together anyway. Mm. Um, I mean, Do Dr. Brown's style is much more gentle than that. And I think he was steamrolled mm. uh, by a very aggressive uh, American professor who really has such contempt for religion that he mm. couldn't take it seriously. And I I I'd seen Bart Ehrman as an academic, you see, who was very respectful, well, normally fairly respectful. Yeah. Um, and expected that approach to continue, and it didn't. Do you enjoy uh, moderating these kinds of debates? Is that something you look forward to doing in the future? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I was a huge privilege to be invited to moderate a debate at Zaytuna College in uh, uh, Berkeley, mm. California, in February, uh, where a, a, a very wonderful professor of um, Islamic law from uh, Toronto University was there, Mohammed Farrell, uh, and uh, our own uh, Sheikh Hassan Spiker, um, oh. And I, I was invited, and did, we did host a debate, although I was told it wasn't quite a debate. It was more of a discussion, but it really was a debate uh, between yeah. these two gentlemen. Um, and that was very, very interesting in front of a big audience at Zay Tuna. And it was fantastic. I really enjoyed that because I, I, I get, you know, at least I get some opportunity to ask the kind of questions I want to ask, even yeah. if I'm not. I, it's not entirely selfish, but I get some small yeah. window where I can actually ask what I want to. So it's very indulgent in that sense. What was the statement of that debate? Um, the, the say was based on, uh, on a saying called, um, uh, a slogan, uh, do what thou wilt, do what thou wilt is the creed of Alistair Crowley, who was an yes. English, was an English yep. Satanist, yep. <laughs> no less. Mm -hmm. Um, Alistair Crowley, he actually, he actually features on a Beatles cover, uh, I kid you not, but that's another wow. story. So do what they, thou wilt. in other words, you're not doing God's will. I, I, I'm doing what I want to do is the only creed I need follow. Yeah. This is, and the argument was, the proposition was that this is actually the creed of our era of the zeitgeist. Yeah. What we believe as a, as a civilization, you do your own thing. Yeah. Um, without any reference to any, uh, any divine command or a divine yeah. frame of reference. So that, that was a discussion and, and uh, it was brought in liberal, that liberalism, nature of liberalism, whether or not you could, uh, Islamic, uh, a Muslim could live in a Muslim, live in a Muslim society, and so we talked about you know uh, rules and and, and anyway, I'll go into all of that. But it, it was very topical, actually. Uh, I thought. But in that case, both of them would agree that that statement would be evil. Yes, but uh, Hassan Spiker um, did not accept that liberalism uh, could uh, actually is a viable project. It, pro project yeah. he, he saw that as problematic, whereas the professor from Toronto uh, accept the thought of liberalism in a modified form. The the Rawlsian uh, liberalism, John Rawls, the American philosopher, uh, w was actually compatible with Islam. Mm. Uh, Spiker said liberalism is not compatible with Islam. My own preference was very very much for Hassan Spiker, I think, but then I'm not. Anyway, that was yeah. not. That wasn't quite what my view was. But, you, know. you mentioned Satanists. Uh, do you know about Albert Pike's uh, Three World War uh, vision? No, I don't. Oh, okay, you might be interested in that. Check it out. Uh, it's a short letter. That's th There's verification that was written way back in the uh, early or late 19th century, so the late 1800s, mm -hmm. um, that he was a Satanist and he had a vision from Satan that there would be three world wars one would knock out Christianity from Europe, knock out the kings. The second would um, set up a Jewish state. And the third would be between Jews and Muslims. And the goal of the three world wars is that it would take all this time to knock out monotheism from the earth. 
and give atheism domination over the earth. And after atheism settles as a dominant uh, mode of operation in the earth, after that, the Luciferian doctrine or the or Satanism itself can manifest and invite people in from from the void that they're in. Uh, that's the idea. I, find, I think you'd you'd find it fascinating. The, uh, yeah, the Albert doing. Pike. Yeah, yeah. Albert Pike was a he was a big Satanist in from in, uh, from America. Uh, okay, one more question from Ooh. our guests. Um, who? This is a good question, actually. This is from Lily Rose. Who would you really like to interview that you haven't yet had the chance? <laughs> yes. Um, okay, I, uh, I had to give a couple of answers. Well, academically, uh, Professor Wal Halak uh, of Columbia Wal-Halak. University mm-hmm. uh, in the States, um, who I'm a big fan of. Um, I, I'm still longing to interview him. Uh, I've not, I'm not exhausted efforts to mm-hmm. uh, get him on. I know people who, uh, Imam Tom uh, tweeted recently, yesterday I think it was, a photograph of him and Wal Halak. Um, you know, he's the author of An Impossible State and numerous other books on uh, Islamic law and epistemology. He's, a, uh, it's, he's very, very juicy uh, academically. And, um, and he's actually a Christian as well. It's amazing. Yeah. But he, he, he would never, you know, I don't think you'd ever know that. I'm not sure he'd approve of me saying this, but I'm not sure you'd ever know that reading his books. Um, clearly has a profound understanding and sympathy towards uh, Islam and the Sharia and so on. So he, he would be my academic number one because uh, I just have such huge uh, respect for him. Um, but, um, you know, other people, um, use of Islam, I, I've, uh, I won't go into the details about that, but I'd like to, uh, he does follow my work but i'd like to have him on as well i think he's a because he's such a, lo- a lovely human being such a good um embodiment i think of of the son of the prophet upon every piece in terms of his adab i mean mm-hmm. and he's obviously very talented as well he's just a very very nice person I, I very much like to um you know just talk to him um not necessarily about heavy theology but uh, whatever so but anyway there's a long list of people i'd like to have on but those two come to mind anyway very good um how, how about this one this is interesting you came into Islam. How have you navigated the different contentious, uh, I should say, groups within Ahl Sunnah? I'm not going to say sects. The groups uh, that hold one another erroneous within the Sunnah, uh, Ahl Sunnah. How yeah. have you navigated that? You know, sometimes that's a problem for people. Yeah, it was for me. I, I, I have, I have journeyed from different positions, and I, I've now reached a position which I'm fairly comfortable with. I came into Islam through the door of Sufism, so through uh, Guy Eaton's work. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of British Muslims uh, become Muslim through Salafism, and I didn't, but through Sufism. And I, I was quite happily there for some time, actually. Uh, being quite anti-Salafi, uh, I picked up that virus um, just because it seemed part of the package. Um, and then because of an event several years ago, uh, a very um, a traumatic event, really, which I'm not going to go into here, but... Um, uh, a couple of Salafi friends of mine um, basically saved my faith. Um, and um, I said, I won't get the issues because uh, it's not the right program for this. Um, and I, I gained an appreciation. And again, this is not something you yourself might perhaps approve of or, or many others, but nevertheless, it's where, I, where I'm at. I gained a positive appreciation for many aspects of, of Salafi, the Salafi outlook. Um, and uh, it, whether it be the Akida, whether it be uh, the Hanbali Madhab, which I identify as a Hanbali, um, uh, 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 and so on, uh, as a methodology uh, of the Salaf. Um, but particularly since the, my work on BT, I found myself, because I, I can't I can't be, although some people would like me to be, I can't be um, confessional on the channel. Yeah. I can't say, well, you, you shouldn't be X, Mr. Muslim. You should follow this school or that school. I, I can't do it. It's simply yeah. wrong. That's not what I do. Um, so I've grown to have a very, I find myself agreeing with many positions and having a positive appreciation of them. Many people would think these positions are irreconcilable. So actually, in some ways, I'm quite pro-Sufi. I don't mean all Sufi practices, but the earlier ones, I, you know, the self-purificatory ones. I can read Guy Eden, who's a Sufi, and still appreciate him. Yeah. But not necessarily, I can also be very pro-Salafi and appreciate what some, you know, a, a lot of Salafi works. So I find, and when it comes to the position of the rulers, I can be quite, I appreciate like his book, Tariya, you know, which is, you know, very much in favor of a caliphate. And I'm a strong believer in the caliphate actually now. 
um, as a really key issue for us today. And also understand those who oppose this kind of so-called, you know, well, you know, the, the whole issues. So I find myself actually affirming an awful lot and denying mm -hmm. very little. And I said to a friend of mine recently, you know, is it, I'm just being consistent, aren't I? And they said, no, 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 this, this is fine. You can, it's the other people who think you can't appreciate the positive aspects of these things that are, that's not a good place to be. And so I, I affirm a lot of Sufism, I affirm a lot of Salafi thought, I agree with the, the Akita of the Salafis, et cetera, et cetera. Even though formally these groups that self-identify yeah. may be very hostile to each other. So Sufis may hate Salafis, Salafis may make massively overgeneralize statements about Sufism and, and dismiss it all. I don't agree with that. So I, I'm actually quite affirming of, of that I do I do have a line by the way I I don't affirm modernism I yeah. don't tend to affirm liberalism at all um, so I guess I, I'm strictly orthodox in my outlook but within that I have quite a, a a broad understanding of what I think is positive I think in the long term uh, having a uh, a very um, uh, uh, nasty heart towards groups in the long term it just hurts you. It's one thing to have an opinion, but it's another thing that let that root so deeply in a person's heart that they have such a hatred. Um, it's one thing to, to sort of dismiss opinions that you disagree with, but that's an opinion and it's not a person. Uh, Imam Ahmad Mashur al-Haddad, he, he had opinions. He was a scholar. Everyone knows his opinions. But he also had a teaching that he wanted all of his murids, all of his disciples to have a clean heart towards all Muslims. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that in the long term is extremely important to keep someone's iman. You see a lot of people who came off, who fell off, it's because they almost were, their hearts were at war with other groups. Mm -hmm. And eventually that never leads to anything good. So, uh, all right, let's see. The... Here's a question says, was Paul involved with the Morabi Toon group in Norwich in the 80s? I don't think so, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, no. <laughs> yeah, that I was, group. I was, that, I was at school then, I wasn't, or even, yeah. even at school. Okay. No, no, no. I, I, know, <laughs> I know what you mean, but no, I, I was too young for that. Yeah. All right. We thank you so much. I don't want to keep you too long because uh, we've, we've gone now an hour. I know you're used to actually live streams that sometimes go two and three and four hours, but mm -hmm. we want to be respectful of your time. Um, okay. Inshallah Ta'ala, I would love to, to do this again and to talk again. Uh, I'm going to keep sharing with you some, you know, neat ideas uh, that I think you'd like and like to make videos out of. And yeah, yeah. That... I mean, we're, we're in contact privately, so please do yeah. share if you have any ideas like that. I really appreciate uh, these suggestions, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I love talking to you. Love your work. And let me tell you, the Ummah loves your work. So many people love Paul Williams. And I think your attitude of sort of neutrality uh, within orthodoxy and islam is very helpful as an interviewer if you were to pick one side or another you alienate all the other people you can't interview them That's true. right so um uh, again i really believe uh, the western world is benefiting so much from your work and allah has chosen you in a very short period of time to do a lot of good we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to con let you continue and give you the tawfiq to continue this and even expand uh blogging theology yeah. expand your your work on twitter uh and everything else jazakallah khair and thank you so much for coming on it's been an absolute delight you've been a great host thank you very much for this opportunity as well thank you thank you barakallah thank you, thank you. assalamu as alaikum Okay, there you have it, brothers and sisters. Uh, again, a lot of you saying you love Paul Williams and love his work. You could tell from his intention. You can see, uh, you can sense a pure intention when you see one. And that, to me, in my view, is a pure intention that is, is reaping the rewards uh, of having that kind of clean heart towards the ummah and just wanting to get to the truth. And that's really... Um, the attitude we should all have. So please make dua for him. Allah continue his work. I did tell everybody that I'm going to read a little bit from Signs of the End of Time. Look at these voluminous works. These scholars, Allah bless them, have spilled so much ink, right? Bringing us so much here. Um, you've been asking about the Sufyani, other signs of the end of time. And... It's going to be in the last volume. So this is volume six, seven. This is the last volume. 
So this should have... Mm, should have looked it up before we came, but I didn't. So, um, Don't tell me this... Wait a second. Is this the last volume? This can't be. Where's Akhir Zaman here? Maybe it's in a different order than I expected. I mean, you go to Akhir Zaman, you pick up the last book, right? <laughs> Logic says that, right? <laughs> pick up the last book. I don't see Akhir Zaman. I see a Malik Mudaffar or Mutawakkil. What do I. That's a Basid history. Shay Ajib, Zain, look this through this for me, for Akhir Zaman. Here, look in here if you see a Sufiani. If not, let's take, um, let's open it up. Thank you, uh, Omar, for the idea. We'll open it up in Ashamila. Okay. Uh, uh, and let's take your Q and A as well at the same time. Okay. That was a good interview, wasn't it? I really liked it. And I'm a big fan, I'm telling you, I'm a big fan of that type of uh, ummah-wide attitude. Okay. All right, let's take some Q&A. Uh, whether we find it or not, we'll have to do it another time properly from al But keep looking. Just write al bidayah when you All right, here is Retzler. Where is that? Retzler, where was it? Um, I'm looking. He asked about how he can attend live here. Listen, what is our schedule here? Our schedule is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. This studio is open, okay? People can attend. We don't have any rules on attendance until something goes wrong, then we'll make one, okay? <laughs> because that's what's going to happen, right? Yeah, send a message to Sweden Society Telegram. Say you're coming. We'll reach out to you, and we'll let you in. We're on the third floor of the soup kitchen, one mile down from University Hospital, Robert Wood Johnson. Okay? Um, and we love for people to come. And sometimes people come with treats. For example, today, there is a nice, beautiful Jersey pizza sitting right there. Let's see what it's like. And if we have to put it in the oven. Who's this from? Zishan again. Okay, a very good pizza. Uh, needs to go be put in the oven. Zane, you know how to use an oven? Okay. All right, you know where the oven is? Downstairs. Look it up, but I don't know if you could put the box in the oven. You can't. <laughs> okay. Okay, so put it on what, 250 or something? Yeah. No, it's open. I opened the front door. Okay, so um, secondly, in the masjid, Tuesday, I'm there giving classes from 5.30 to 7.00. Okay, you can sit on those classes. Tonight, what's what's the gentleman's name who gave that? Tonight we have a, an event, John Retzler. We have an, an event tonight at 7.30 with Suhba. I'm having a discussion with the Imam Safwan. Okay. That, that's for young professionals. Okay, It's not for, mar for, for made for marriage, but it's the same people, the same age of people who want to get married. So you come to that. Number three, every Thursday is a big night at MBIC. I'm there, I give, I read from the books of Tasawwuf, the books of Sidi Ahmad Zarruq, okay, works of Tasawwuf. And then we have Night of Salah on the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Next year, it's going to be Tasawwuf for an hour, Darul Fetch classes for an hour and a half, two hours. Then Night of Salah on the Prophet, where we read the poetry and the Salah on the Prophet from Al-Habib Omar bin Said and bin Hafil. Every Friday night we got something going on. But this Friday, the youth are going to New York. I don't think I'm going. I think I need to just take the night off to prepare for the Omar trip. So this Friday, I won't be coming down to the masjid. But um, the youth will be going to New York City for the youth night. All right? But every Friday night, I'm in the mosque. And every Jum'ah... We're in the masjid, and then we go out to lunch. That lunch is so important, I can't tell you. It's one of the sunan of many ulama that they, they do that, okay? 
and have a lunch and, and, and chill out. Here's Jennifer Phillips. Shocker question. Is the third awaited temple actually the current masjid there that the Jews haven't been able to recognize? Is it? I don't know. Good question. Hey, uh, Zag, can you look that up or you get kicked off of Facebook if you... Can you look up if the temple... Okay, the third awaited temple is in the location of the mosque of Al-Aqsa, Masjid Al-Aqsa, or not. Uh, we have, I am sitting here with one of the top programmers of Facebook. He's working on Meta. He is a believer in Meta, that Meta is actually something that's going to happen. Okay, and I'm telling you why it might happen, because Zuck needs a success. Tell me the last product he did that was successful. He bought it. Instagram. He bought it. Right? WhatsApp. He bought it. Facebook. He stole it. That's, that's what the, what's it called? The, that's how success is made. You have to... You steal. steal. Yeah. yeah. Steal. But... The quarter brother, I forgot. Yeah. Uh, genius is steal. Yes. Steve Jobs. <laughs> right? Look. Uh, Musk, though, does stuff. You have to admit that. Tesla wasn't his invention but he took it and made it a reality. Those those two guys were going to fail, right? The guys who founded Tesla, were they weren't sharp. They weren't strong. They weren't gangsters, right? He took it and he made it a reality. SpaceX, it's the satellite. I mean, anyone can buy a satellite, right? But he just keeps buying satellites. So he has Neuralink now. The Tesla just released a robot. Tesla's going to be the leader in robots. You saw it's the robot today, right? Yeah, on Oculus Prime, what's his name? What's the Transformer's name? Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime. That's what he called it. Shooting a, gun. shooting a gun, dancing, everything. But it walks like it has to go to the bathroom, yeah, yeah. right? Did you see it? <laughs> Optimus, you guys didn't see, he released a video on Optimus today, right? Uh, Optimus is his new robot, okay? I don't know what Optimus, what that robot for regular people is going to do. We'll find, we will definitely find uses for it. But eventually, my worry is that eventually it's going to be used for war and policing. And there's been no empathy. See, the thing is, in policing, there's empathy. When, when a police pulls you over or stops you or something, there's some chance I can talk to him and he could see that I'm in distress. But if I'm speeding, let's say, for example, and there's, hey, hold on, my wife's about to have a baby and I get stopped by a robot, there's no, some of that empathy is a problem. Lack of empathy, I should say, is a problem. That's still happened, though. Like, I don't think it'll get that far. I don't like it, and I hope not. I hope it doesn't end up policing us now. Yeah. Yeah. That's why there's a big moral dilemma with whether we could use AI in wars. Yeah, big moral dilemma on AI in wars. Because that's why I think, like, if you have that robot and that robot kills a baby, no one's going to be responsible because they're just going to say, a glitch, right? Mm. Right? And no one will actually feel guilty either. Like, when you do that stuff, war crimes usually come to an end because people, they know someone's guilty. But if you keep saying, oh, this is an accident, it's a glitch. Okay. All right, so f tell me if you got find out about the third temple, and then, then I have to leave. Yanni Date Seed says, I'm supposed to follow one of the four Imams. The answer is yes. We Muslims believe that the the early scholars they sought to find the truth and they developed these methodologies. Truth about what? When we have the Quran and the Sunnah, we have the truth, right? But the Quran and the Hadith have texts in them, have verses, have hadiths that can have multiple meanings. And there are some narrations from companions. They heard something from the Prophet. Other companions heard something else from the Prophet. How do we bring these two together? Which one do we choose? Okay. Some companions understood a verse of Quran meaning one thing. Others understood it meaning another thing. Which one do we go by? So in that realm of things, we need scholarship. When you, when you, we're not scholars. We're going to seek out the scholars and follow their scholarship. When we follow their scholarship, you're essentially following the person you believe is most worthy of following. And you're following the methodology that you believe is the right methodology. So what do you do? You study the four imams. Watch their videos. Read books about them. Study all four. Give yourself a whole year just to let it settle. You're not going to study like boom, boom, boom. No. 
You're going to study over time. Let things marinate in your mind. Observe mosques. Observe scholars. Then make a decision of who you believe is most worthy of following. Okay? That's how simple it is. Okay? It's like picking a doctor. Okay? You got to go. I got to run. Okay. Um, a lot of questions coming in here. Bring on Mufti Abu Laith. Please. Um, purify our, com or, or chat section here from this nonsense. Can we take Sira from Muhammad Saraksi? I don't know who he is. Maybe I should look him up. Rose gold. Can you explain the verse? Allah doesn't change your condition unless you change what is within yourselves. It me. You know what this verse came out of? A group of Bani Israel in the ancient times and had a prophet. They obeyed that prophet. They lived by that, the, the Torah. They were so righteous that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stabilized their monarchy, their village, gave them wealth. Their children were coming out good. Okay? It doesn't mean there's no problems in life, but in general, no major issues. Their enemies were at bay. Their market was moving. Their marriages were successful. Their kids were good. They noticed, subhanAllah, how much khair is coming in, in, our, in our world, in our society, in our lives. So how much goodness. So they went to their prophet and they said, we're worried to lose this goodness. Then Allah revealed to him, Allah will not change your condition, all this goodness, unless you change what is within yourselves. So it originally came down, was revealed for goodness. Okay. So if you're think everything's going well, it's going to continue to go well as long as you're following the Sharia and uh, abiding by it and remembering Allah much and devoting yourself to your Creator. It also applies to the opposite. When we're in bad in a bad state, bad political condition, bad worldly condition, it's never going to change unless we correct ourselves. All right, fix our hearts, fix our deeds, start following the Sharia, and start devoting ourselves to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Okay. The Albert Pike prophecy has me deeply worried. I need some hope. Could you expound upon it? Yeah, they made it. Satan made a big mistake. He doesn't realize that Allah Taala is going to bring down Al Imam Al Mahdi, Prophet Isa bin Maryam, and Iblis is making a simple mistake that he is going to outdo God's plan. He's not going to outdo God's plan, but there will be trickery that he does in the world. Mass level of trickery. Mass level of lies. We're already seeing it. It's just happening in slow motion because real life happens in slow motion 90% of the time, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, there will always be a people upon the truth. And Allah ta'ala said, there will always be people coming into the truth. And the numbers of Muslims will always be on the increase. Converts are on the increase, okay? Uh, and so his plan is, is going to fail at that point. Because up to now, he has not yet messed with the Ummah of Islam in the sense of these three world wars. The first, he said, it's all about Europe. Second one is established Israel, also was in Europe. The third one, this one is against the Ummah of Islam, so is not going to succeed. And whatever appears like success will be against him. Okay, we'll turn back against him. Uh, come up to Boston. Yes, I'll come up to Boston, inshallah. I have to come up to Boston in these big cities. Please invite Sheikh Suleiman Van Ail. I will, inshallah ta'ala. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd love to hang out with you a little bit more, but um, we have to go. Jazakumullah khairan, everybody. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr inna al-insana la fi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu amanu salihat وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر محمد كوليبالي go to مسجد الحسين go to مسجد الإمام الشافعي
if you only have time for two masajid. If not, then there are nine of these masajid all in a row. Masjid Hussein, Al Azhar al Sharif, Masjid al Shafi, Sayyidah Zainab, Sayyidah Aisha, Sidi, uh, 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 Ahmed al Dardir. There are nine such masajid, so go to all of them. Jazakumullah khairan. Oh, well, it's uh, Asr is over. I just did it within myself during the stream, actually. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.